a warm greetings to all we have come here for tanwas global pediatric medicine webinar series 2020 and this program is going to be for 27th and tomorrow my request dr r ram prabhu professor head veterinary clinical complex veterinary college and research institute tirunelveli for the welcome and good evening to all participants from india and good morning to dr christian we the veterinary clinical complex under the directorate of clinics tamil nadu veterinary and animal sciences university have the privilege of hosting the global pediatric medicine webinar series 2020 and in this webinar two eminent speakers are sharing their past experiences in the field of bovine medicine to the faculty students and bovine practitioners across the globe it is my great pleasure and on behalf of the directorate of clinics tanwas to welcome all of you from all over the world it also gives me great pleasure to welcome the dignitaries to the inaugural function of global webinar series we would like to take this opportunity to express our heartfelt welcome to the honorable vice chancellor of tanwas dr c balachandran for honoring our invitation to be the chief guest of this grand function and to inaugurate the global pediatric medicine webinar series 2020 i am also grateful to the vice chancellor for permitting us to host the webinar organized by this department on behalf of the organizing committee i welcome our beloved director of clinics dr s balasubramanian who is the architect of for conducting this webinar and also guiding us for the development of hospital activities of the university and for accepting our invitation to grace the occasion and deliver his address our heartly welcome to professor christian gerdak director of clinics for ruminants head of internal medicine university of zurich switzerland for accepting our invitation to deliver a webinar on abdominal ultrasonography in cattle and we are aware that the university of zurich is the pioneer institute of in boy ultrasonography i extend a warm welcome to all the deans of constituent college of tanwas directors of the university for their constant support and encouragement for the conduct of this program as at the outset let me express my deep gratitude and sincere thanks to to karnanidhi vice president alamik pharmaceuticals and dr sandosh inde for their technical support for the conduct of the webinar series by the directorate of clinics and welcome them to the webinar on behalf of the organizing committee i extend a warm welcome to the faculty of tanwas veterinary colleges of india abroad students bovine practitioners in india and abroad for the inaugural function of the webinar i welcome all my organizing committee members dr vijay kumar dr chavi gupta dr krunav garse dr vimal rajkumar dr arnaman and dr vishnu gurbaran for their continuous support for the conduct of the webinar i welcome one and all for the program thank you thank you sir for the welcome address may i request sir, our respected director of clinics dr s balz for name for the introduction of the webinar honorable vice chancellor tamil nadu veterinary and animal sciences university professor dr c balachandran internationally acclaimed speakers of the webinar professor christian gaspack director of clinic for ruminants and department of farm animals university of zurich dr vengai mavangira faculty large animal clinical sciences college of veterinary medicine Michigan State University USA the organizing secretary Dr Ram Prabhu Prosen Head Veterinary Clinical Complex Tirunelveli the co-organizing secretaries Dr Vijay Kumar and Dr Chavi Gupta technical coordinators Dr Trinavakar sir Dr Vimal Rajkumar moderators Dr Vishnu Guru Baran and Dr Arnaman deans of constituent veterinary colleges heads of department Dr Krishna Kumar head of gynecology Dr Kavita head of clinical medicine Dr Arun Prasad head of RVS section faculty members participants from different states of the country and abroad greetings and a very warm good evening and good morning to one and all 
I am here to give a, a very brief note about the webinar that is being organized by the Directorate of Clinics, Tanawas. See, under the guidance of the Honorable Vice Chancellor and the munificent support extended by the Honorable Vice Chancellor, the Directorate of Clinics, Tanawas, has so far organized four webinars for the veterinary undergraduates of all four constituent colleges of Tanawas. Further, the Directorate of Clinics has initiated global webinars for the benefit of veterinary undergraduates, postgraduates, faculty members, field and practicing veterinarians worldwide. So in that series, we have first organized in the month of August, a global veterinary clinical sciences webinar uh, in which we had an international speaker, Dr. Carolina from Poland. On 16th and 17th of September, we had Tanua's Global Veterinary Imaging Sciences Webinar Series 2020, in which we had two international speakers, one Dr. Natasha Moto from Trinidad and Tobago and Dr. Laura Martinelli from Italy. On 16-10, we had a special webinar, World Anesthesia Day 2020, commemorative webinar on critical care anesthesia. This was organized by Resident Veterinary Services Section in which we had Dr. Kirk Munoz from Michigan State University, USA. During 6th and 8th November, we had Global Veterinary Large Animal Science Webinar Series 2020, organized by the Veterinary University Peripheral Hospital. In this, we had four speakers, Dr. Carla Carlton, Dr. Andres Contrias, Dr. Elizabeth Carr from USA, and Dr. Orlith Clary from Canada. To take forward the above committed efforts of the Directorate of Clinics, Tanuas, the Veterinary Clinical Complex, Veterinary College and Research Institute, Tirunelveli, is now organizing this Tanuas Global Biotric Medicine Webinar Series 2020 on two topics. One is on abdominal ultrasonography in cattle by Professor Christian Gespak from uh, Switzerland and uh, diagnosis and management of diseases of cattle by Dr. Vengai Mavangira from USA. With great confidence in the efforts taken by this university, I am sure that this webinar series will certainly be valuable to all the participants to enrich their knowledge in biotic medicine. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for the brief introduction of the webinar. May I request our honorable and respected Vice Chancellor of Tanuas, Dr. C. Balachandran, for the presidential address. Uh, very good evening from Chennai. My esteemed uh, colleague, the Director of uh, Clinics, Dr. Balas Brahmaniam, and our uh, guest speaker, uh, Professor Christian Gesbach, the Organizing Secretary, Dr. Ram Prabhu, the Organizing Secretary, Dr. Vijay Kumar, and Dr. Chavi Gupta. And we have our uh, heads of departments from medicine, gynecology, and uh, resident veterinary section. Other faculty members uh, for supporting this and uh, the participants. So it is uh, a small venture we have made uh, more than a year back on uh, sharing our own experience. So we have, uh, for the benefit of the um, uh, speaker, uh, we have four veterinary colleges uh, in this state and uh, uh, all of them have, having uh, the set of the art facilities. And then it was uh, the wish that they should share the experiences among themselves. This is what very simple way it started. And then this uh, pandemic situation has given us an opportunity to go globally. So that is a thing. In that uh, effort, uh, this Directorate of Clinics has been uh, organizing several uh, such online uh, programs, uh, inviting eminent uh, speakers from the from different uh, fields. I'm happy about that. And as usual, today's uh, topic uh, where we are going to deal on abdominal ultrasonography uh, in cattle and later they will be dealing on the diagnosis and management of diseases in cattle. So uh, 
as it is expected that initially any kind of client it will have its own uh, way of uh, development larger sometimes difficult to handle and so on so as the days uh, pass by so and uh, for making an easy use first we have to bring it to a stage where it can be easily portable and then uh, can be used in different uh, conditions so that is how this uh, ultrasonography is developed and also on the other side how to operate them that is another issue uh, having the help of uh, somebody as a technician or something so from that uh, time it has uh, also made a much more easier in operationally so that individuals can handle uh, that one and it has come in a long way uh, for the practicing veterinarians so now uh, this is uh, as they say it is regarded as one of the best in the practice so that is a very good uh, thing going on and especially in this part as you are aware this madras veterinary college uh, uh, had both uh, large number of uh, cattle coming in and then um, uh, because of the expansion of the city uh, this is coming down but uh, the small animal practice is going up but with the other institutions we have we have enough uh, cases that are coming here to deal with so naturally the ultra uh, sound has uh, become a part of uh, them of course as it is seen that it is started from for the gynecologist to start in a simple way for their own uh, issues and then in um, diagnosing the uh, that is a pregnancy and uh, so on but it has again extended in different manner in its own field also we could see the kind of uh, assessing the embryo fetal viability estimation of age of fetus and then uh, later nowadays it is uh, quite used in case of assisted reproduction then uh, uh, how to pick up the ovum through ultrasound guidance so that is it is uh, Uh, moving on and then from this part now uh, what you are going to hear is that uh, it can be used in other uh, areas also yeah, that way it is uh, taken up for the abdominal ultrasonography so that is how it is uh, coming up uh, now we are uh, happy that you have invited an eminent person uh, on this uh, field and also uh, which was uh, there very limited because everybody cannot handle it so later as it is simplified now we could see every other person is able to use and uh, also the practicing veterinarians have taken up lot of interest and then they started using it so it it has become very uh, commonly used equipment that is uh, only thing is how to share these experiences uh, so that is a question uh, here and we are trying to find answer for them i am happy the uh, 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 you can see the colleague of uh, professor willy brown you are here uh, professor uh, christian just back so uh, they have uh, specialized uh, also on the gastrointestinal uh, uh, disorders especially they said about the uh, uh, traumatic reticular peritonitis it is left and uh, right di- displacement of abomasum ileus of the small intestine dilatation displacement of the cecum like that it is a good experience they have so i'm happy uh, to have them because this type of uh, thing uh, gives a lot of opportunities to interact and then uh, no nuances what you know so that is being shared and then then only all our people who are practicing it they will recollect and then try to use in their practice and then also discuss on these uh, uh, points uh, Uh, with you also uh, so here also they have started using on this uh, helpful in the case of uh, uh, taking biopsy and other materials in finding any uh, abscesses or uh, the fluid in dairy cows and also uh, in uh, other manner which can be uh, used here so that is how it is uh, coming up on this uh, day and uh, so how far you can extend this type of uh, equipment the to improve the technology so that uh, it can be widely practiced by our uh, uh, veterinarians uh, faculty members and our students hope this uh, deliberations will uh, bring the desired uh, effect uh, here especially on abdominal ultrasonography uh, hope the our own uh, 
undergraduate, postgraduate students and practitioners will get benefited from this. And uh, I could see that uh, there are around 746 uh, um, people have uh, registered for this uh, program and uh, 732 are from India. And uh, of course, from this part, more number is, but more than equal part is from other states of the India and also from abroad, uh, people have registered. They are very eagerly looking for your uh, lecture. At this point, I congratulate the organizing team for uh, having thought of it and uh, wish the program a uh, success and uh, thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much, sir, for the presidential address. Now uh, it is for the time for the webinar. Professor Christian gets back, MS Diploma ACVIM and the Director of Clinic of uh, Ruminants, Head of Internal Medicine Department of Farm Animals, University of Zurich, Switzerland. So now handing over the mic to Professor Christian Gaspak. So we are eagerly waiting for the, uh, uh, the lecture on abdominal ultrasonography in cattle. Over to you, sir. So dear chair, dear organizing committee, thank you very much for inviting me, for giving me the opportunity to give you my presentation. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. And I'm very much looking forward to sharing this webinar with you. And um, so I will start talking about abdominal ultrasound in cattle. As you said before, it's becoming more and more important, not only at the university, also in practice. Uh, ultrasonography is becoming more and more available, and um, it needs some experience to read out your findings. And what I want to do today is to show some basics, show some typical imaging approach to the exam. And I also want to, I also want to um, bring some examples, some cases. So we have some cases uh, with that. So first of all, we've got to, there we go. First of all, the technique. Um, we need some different probes to reach to the organs we, we want to see. So you see the megahertz, uh, it's quite different. So for the more deeper structures like intestine or all structures of the liver, uh, we need about two megahertz going up to 10 megahertz for a rectal exam, uh, which is also part of the whole workup. And there are, of course, different types of ultrasound machines. Um, the for reproduction used smaller ultrasound machines, they work well for abdominal ultrasound as well, with some limitations, of course, but um, it's, it's possible to see findings also with smaller machines. And for a good, for good imaging, it is good to clip the cow. So in our clinic, everybody knows this is the cow from the medicine section because she's clipped. And students try to figure out where the cow is clipped. So they might get some answers already. What's the problem of the cow? But um, we usually clip the whole cow. You can use alcohol as well to get better contact and ultrasound gel. So you have a good contact and a good imaging. And then we always try to do a complete examination of the whole abdomen. And we're using a systematic approach. So we are starting with the reticulum, which is very important. 
also include the spleen, the whole rumen, and parts of the abomasum, uh, which are medial or even a little bit on the left side. And on the right side, of course, um, the liver, the opomasum, uh, the ome sorry, the omasum, which is missing out here on that image, parts of the apomasum, and then intestine, and the right kidney right there. Um, it's a very good technique, but there are also limitations because we can, all, we can only see structures just adjacent to the body wall, so we can't look into the whole, whole cow, unfortunately. Most organs are not entirely visible, for example, the rumen, and the contents are not always visible. And then the body condition of the cow, of course, is also maybe limiting. So we like skinny cows that we see a lot. Those fat cows, uh, they are difficult. And then the penetration of the waves into the cows are a limiting factor. And if there's gas in the abdomen, like for, uh, followed by peritonitis or after abdominal surgery, we are very limited. We don't see a lot. So let's start with the reticulum. The reticulum, we start here with a parasternal approach from that area here, so we try to get this image here. What are the indications to look at the reticulum? Of course, reticuloperitonitis. We have evidence of reticuloperitonitis when we see more fluid or fibrin or even abscesses or adhesions. But also diseases like vagal indigestion, we can see hypermotility or local peritonitis or also adhesions causing symptoms of vagal indigestion. And just simple fluid, not necessarily uh, peritonitis, but an ascites fluid with no fibrin. This is all we need to look for when we look at the reticulum. And this is the typical appearance of the reticulum. Of course, we flip the image. So now the probe is coming from here. And the reticulum right here is what we see here. And parts of the rumen we can see here. On the next slide, Just to, to remember the structures we want to see, the body wall is up here. Then we have a blood vessel. This is the vena musculophrenica. And here is the diaphragm because it shows up right here. So when we look here with the ultrasound, we see body wall and then the diaphragm and then the reticulum and here parts of the rumen. So it's uh, always a good point to start because this is something you um, that looks familiar to, to the examiner. So this is where I like to start the exam. Here you know where you're at and this is a good orientation, the reticulum. If you're not sure, just wait for contractions which are typical for the reticulum, as we will see in a few minutes. Sometimes the reticulum might show up like this. This is still normal structure. You can even see the layers of the reticular wall, the serosa, the muscularis, and the mucosa, with the typical structure and always some sediment within the honeycomb structure of the reticular wall. And sometimes you can also see parts of the apomasum. So here again, reticulum. 
And we always have, this is cranially, and this is caudal. So we always uh, put the probe so the reticulum is on the cranial side and caudally we see, for example, rumen or apomasum. So reticulum, apomasum, rumen in that case. And these are the typical folds of the apomasal mucosa, as we know from anatomy. So this is what we can see here. So here we can tell this is just um, apomasum. Although it's a little bit on the left side, it's a normal finding. So this is the normal appearance of the reticulum, but um, we also look at the motility, which tells us a lot. So usually we should see three biphasic contractions within three minutes. Biphasic, so we always have a short phase followed by a full contraction. Then there will be a pause. Then we have a short phase and then a full contraction. Um, duration, um, you see there are even numbers for that, but important is it's three and three minutes. The interval between contraction is about 30 to 40 seconds. In cows that are ruminating at the time we're doing ultrasounds, they have a third phase, they have a triphasic contraction. First, second, third and three of them within three minutes. So we need to stick to the reticulum for three minutes at least to make sure we can count the contractions. And with these findings, we can tell the motility is normal. And on the next video, I will show you the normal contraction of the reticulum. Here again, this is the reticulum. And the contraction, again, cranial, caudal, head, tail. So the contraction will go this way, one phase, second phase. This is some motility because the cow is breathing, but the real contraction will follow now. See also some apomasum here. And if you look close, we can tell that cow is ruminating while we do ultrasound because there were three phases. One, two, and the third. And we can tell there are no adhesions. The reticulum is moving freely. No adhesions to the body wall. Everything works well. So this is a normal finding of the reticulum. And this is always my first part of the ultrasound examination of the abdomen. So the, why is it important to look at the motility? The interval between the contractions can be increased. So we have less contractions in three minutes. Can be caused by simply stress, pain, but also functional stenosis or peritonitis, and in general, severe disease causing, causing a, a really depressed condition of the cow, and also drugs, for the best example, xylazine, will cause a reduction in the motility. So it can be an unspecific finding based on another disease. The amplitude can be reduced, so there's less movement because of adhesions. So the, the, the reticulum can't contract completely because it gets stuck somewhere. And with vagal indigestion, so functional stenosis, especially proximal functional stenosis, they have a hypermotility, can be up to six contraction within three minutes. That is a typical sign for a proximal functional stenosis. So I would like to 
show a first case. We have a three-year-old Holstein freezing cow. She's not pregnant. And she was referred for reduced appetite and no rumination. So a quite unspecific history on that one. On physical examination, this is, of course, not the cow. <laughs> That's a brown Swiss. Um, we did the pole test. So we lift it up here to see if the cow is grunting and therefore painful. She was positive for that. She was dehydrated and the rumen motility was reduced. We did some blood work um, to make it short. She had evidence of inflammation. So the combination of clinical signs and blood work we were suspecting maybe a peritonitis, so we did do an ultrasound, and this is what we saw. So on these examples, there's always this cow and the probe, so you can see where we at. This is quite important to know where we put the probe, so we can identify the structures. So here is the reticulum. Here's the rumen, so what we want to see. But this is all abnormal here. So black, everything that's black is fluid, and these hyperechoic structures are fibrin, so we can tell the cow has a peritonitis, fibrinous peritonitis, and um, this is, of course, an important finding, but we need to stick to that area and to see what happens. So we also need to look for the motility. And you see in the next, it's not a video, but you see on the next image here, the reticulum is contracting. And now you can see way more fluid, but you can also tell there's no adhesion. So it's still able to move, um, which is a good, which is good news. Um, so we have at least localized peritonitis. One important thing in ultrasound is to find out is the peritonitis localized or generalized, because that's a completely different prognosis for the cow. So suspecting peritonitis, we did also radiographs, and we could see the reticulum, sternum, there would be the forelimb. And here we have that nail sticking out of the reticulum. So we gave a magnet. And a day later, we did do a, a control radiograph to see if the magnet pulled the nail. That would be the best. But as we can tell, this didn't work. And here you see the contour of the reticulum as well. It should be, shouldn't look like this, so that tells us there must be fibrin, there must be inflammation because of, of this shape here. It should be one line like this, but something is, something is here. Um, but we can't see the fibrin on, on radiography. Unfortunately, the prognosis was not good. The owner did not decide to do treatment, so we had to slaughter the cow, and we see this confirmed our radiographs. The nail was sticking out of the reticulum. This is the outside of the reticulum. So uh, lots of fibrin and inflammation. And on this side here, um, we see the nail from inside. This is what we could get out here. So. This is, of course, causing lots of inflammation. So we see the normal shape of the reticular wall. And this is the severely inflamed edematous uh, wall. Here is, is the tract of the, of the foreign body that sticks throughout here. Um, it's not always possible to see that on ultrasound. So um, 
this is difficult to see. Sometimes you might see the edema within the wall, but um, always be aware you don't see the whole reticulum, just the part where you stick the probe. So um, it's not a complete exam of the reticulum. So reticular peritonitis in general, of course, the physical examination uh, gives us some suspicion, but it's not always specific. Um, ultrasonography is a very good tool to look for evidence of inflammation or even abscesses. <clears throat> but also very important for the prognosis of the patient, the extent of the lesions. Is it local or generalized? And radiography finally helps us to see if there's a metal opaque foreign body and also to check for the location of the magnet. And if we gave a magnet, we also use it a second time to follow up after application of the magnet to see if we were successful or if we need to go to surgery. So in the area of the reticulum, as we see here again, reticulum, um, we look for free fluid, like in this example here, fibrin, or even abscesses, and also the distance between, between body wall and reticulum is elevated, so the reticulum doesn't reach to the body wall, so there must be something in between. Um, this is also a good sign. And also, never forget, look at the motility. And then this example here, uh, we don't see the reticulum very well anymore because it's replaced by a big abscess, which is um, formed secondary to a foreign body. And in this case, this is a very old image, and this is a very, very rare image because here we see the reticulum, and this is a foreign body. Although I'm showing you that image, I always say, you're not able to see foreign bodies with ultrasound. Usually it's not possible. This is one single case in 20 years where we could see a wire sticking out, but usually we don't see that. So with ultrasound, we are not able to prove if there is a foreign body or not. Or not. So there's still differentials for the peritonitis. And also important always look at adjacent structures. So it's not only the reticulum, there are also um, other structures like uh, this, the liver, spleen, heart, or mental bursa. These are the most important structures we need to look um, if they're affected or not. This example here is an abscess that has been formed between the reticulum and the liver. And these abscesses are, of course, a major complication, causing recurrent fever, causing recurrent illness, causing problems with uh, motility of the first damages. So it's always important to find those abscesses. We see this example here. This is liver, and this is all abscess. Now, where is the location for these abscesses caused by foreign bodies? This is very low in this area between the ribs, and if you do ultrasound of the liver, always keep going all the way down. This is always bad imaging because of the ribs, but here are the abscesses and it's easy to miss them. So it's very important also to stick the probe on that area as well. Another example, uh, this is the spleen, which was involved into the peritonitis as we see on that ultrasound image, 
this is the spleen surrounded from uh, by fibrin and lots of fluid, free fluid. Here's the reticulum, parts of the rumen. But this is what I want to show here, the spleen. It's just the tip of the spleen, but there's all peritonitis around that. <clears throat> Another major complication, of course, is um, a foreign body sticking into the heart. So this is uh, the pericardium opened. This is the heart. And the virus even still sticking into the heart. So the cow developed a really bad pericardi traumatic pericarditis. And this is... More how well, we saw an ultrasound here, the pericardium, lots of fluid in there, lots of fibrin. Um, and this is an important finding um, because this affects the prognosis for sure. Um, these cows are, are lost, unfortunately. We have a second cow I want to present. It's a three-year-old uh, Holstein freezing cow, only four days in milk. She dropped in milk yield, didn't eat anymore. Also the typical history, tachycardia, no rumen motility, and she had a toxic, um, uh, toxic neutrophils, toxemia, and the PCV was very high. At the same time, the total protein was very low which is always an alarming sign. And on ultrasound, this is the area where we looked at the reticulum again. Um, we see lots of fluid, reticulum right here, rumen right here, and then a lot of fluid, fibrin, so evidence of peritonitis. Now, it's important to keep looking. So is this the only area that is affected? Um, if this is only here, only in that area, that is a local peritonitis, so uh, we probably can manage that. But um, now we need to look at the whole cow to see how the inflammation extends throughout the cow. So uh, we go up here to the spleen and we see there's also fluid around the spleen. And when we go a little bit more in this area, so rumen, you see there's lots of fluid, fibrin. See, as the cow is breathing, you see the movement in the fibrin. It's the typical movement of fibrin and fluid. Um, so we can tell we have peritonitis in this area, in this area, everywhere here. So this is a good evidence for a generalized peritonitis, but we also need to look at the other side. So we look in this area here where the intestines are, and this is our finding here. This is body wall, abdomen, this is omentum, and here are the small intestines and surrounded by fluids and probably some fiber in here, the hyperechoic structures. But it's in, in peritonitis, it's always bad news if there's fluid around the intestines within the um, uh, intestinal room. Um, so this cow definitely has a generalized peritonitis. Um, we also took radiographs on that cow and we see the reason for that. She has also a nail sticking out almost all the way. And um, we also see a lot of gas around here, which is typical for, um, for gas building bacteria for peritonitis. Um, so this is a very clear finding. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't 
save that cow as well. Um, and I show you what we found. We compare this image here with the postmortem, and we see this nail is sticking out all the way, causing lots of fibrin inflammation. And, and um, so this is the nail, almost seven to eight centimeter. And lots of adhesions and fibrin. This is what we saw here. Now the fluid is gone, but we see all the fibrin here um, between the organs and the body wall. This is exactly what we see here. And even the entire rumen was affected. And so we also had fibrin and peritonitis between the intestinal loops. And this is what we saw here on ultrasound. Fluid around fibrin, and this is what we see, saw here. So um, these are very clear findings on that case. The question is, could we tap that fluid and just see how bad it is? Um, the problem is there are often many pockets with different fluids. Um, therefore, I like to do ultrasound guided puncture of fluid. Uh, so we know where are the findings, where need, do we need to tap. You see these two samples here from the same cow. They look about the same, but we took them from different locations. And this was not smelling, that was just exudate. And this was bare pus, smelling like pus. So we had different, if we just tap one side, we might have a different uh, not the not the whole picture of the of the findings. Um, therefore, I like to use ultrasound for puncture. In that cow, we were suspecting generalized peritonitis because when we look back at the blood work, the cow was losing fluid and protein into the abdominal cavity. So, um, this is a good sample for generalized peritonitis diagnosed by ultrasound. Here again the reticulum, but we also look at the ruminal groove between the dorsal and the ventral uh, ruminal sac. Indications for that are extent of peritonitis, but are also omental bursitis, and left displacement of the epomesum, because if the epomesum is displaced to the left side, we don't see the rumen anymore here. So this is also an important area to look at. And this is what we see. So this groove here is right here. There's some blood vessels in there, omentum, and this is the dorsal ruminal sac, and this is the ventral ruminal sac. And this is the normal appearance. With ascites or peritonitis, we do see fluid in between the rumen and the body wall. And in that case, we do see free abdominal fluid. So we have the layers body wall. Then this line here is the omentum, then the ruminal wall right here, and then the rumen. We don't see the contents of the rumen usually, uh, so there's just nothing behind that wall. Sometimes we can see it if it's very fluidy, but usually we don't see uh, the ruminal contents very well. So this is about the image we want to see when we look at the, at the rumen. Now this Fluid is between body wall and omentum. This space here is filled with fluid. So we don't we can't tell if it's an ascites or peritonitis. We would have to examine the fluid, but we can tell there is fluid. This image, it's a little bit an older image. The quality is not very good. Um, but there's a there's a big difference. We also see free fluid. We don't see the body wall here, but 
Here is free fluid, as we saw here. But between the omentum and the rumino wall, there's also free fluid and fibrin and hyperechoic material. Free fluid and fluid also here. This is the typical finding for an omental bursitis caused by either a foreign body or a ruptured apomasal ulcer. So typical finding on the left side when we look at the rumen. And usually we have more material in here because this is contents from the apomasum if it's an ulcer, and this is just free fluid, but it will be exudate when we look at it closer. As an example, I want to show you another case. Um, this is a little five-month-old bull. He was presented for fever and diarrhea. He was treated for uh, coccidia. And at the day of, of uh, referral, he had a quite distended abdomen. And so he, he was referred for further diagnostics. And um, we could tell the animal was depressed. Heart rate was very high. The sclera were very injected here, so probably due to inflammation. And um, there was no rumen motility. The abdomen was distended. And there was a ping and a succussion on the right side of the calf, of the little bull. On blocked work, we could see severe dehydration, hemoconcentration, at the same time low protein, that tells us something, and evidence of acute inflammation as well. And when we looked at the neutrophil morphology, there was also evidence of toxemia and chemistry, to make it short, Severe dehydration, severe acetemia, suspecting pre-renal acetemia here, and evidence of reflux, gastrointestinal reflux. And we remember we had the ping and the succussion on the right side, so together with that blood work, it might be a right displacement of the apomasum, uh, which was very likely or very possible at this point in time. So we had a problem list of reduced general condition, distended abdomen, ping and succussion on the right side, toxemia, reflux, hemoconcentration, and isotemia. So we started with the ultrasound on the right side. This is not the little bull. This is, again, just my... my Example cow. Um, so we started here in the right flank, and this is what we could see. There is a lot of fluid, and these little white dots, this is gas. And here, these lines, this is gas as well. That would be typical for a distended organ with fluid and gas, as we see, for example, in a displaced and dilated abomasum. So it could well be a displaced abomasum. So we we extended our exam. So we, we looked at the area of the liver in this area. And we could tell this is the tip of the liver. And there's fluid around the liver, so that fluid is free in the abdomen. This is not inside an organ. And what we also can tell based on this image here, if the apomasum is displaced to the right side, the liver should be hidden by the apomasum. So when we 
when we are able to see the liver, then there is no apomasum displaced. So here must be another reason. So we kept looking. We went to the left side, to the reticulum. And also here, we could see a lot of fluid, free fluid in the abdomen, around the reticulum, some fibrin. And then we went to the area of the rumen. And this is where we had this finding here. I show you the video. Before I show you the video, this is the body wall and this is the rumen wall. But there's something in between. As the cow is breathing, we see that movement. It's not, it's not an active mo movement of an organ. What we see here I try to um, this is this is the cow from cross section. We look from behind right side, left side with the rumen, of course, and this is the omentum and everything that is black is the omental bursa which is going to the ruminal groove all the way to the apomasum. And there should be nothing here. There should nothing in be here. And you see, oh, let me just, so, sorry, yes. Um, see, this is the inner side of the omental bursa and this is this leaf of the omental bursa. So there is fluid within the omental bursa, so that animal has a omental bursitis, which was the cause for the gasps and for the distension. Um, again, here, the, even a better image, rumen, and then contents within the omental bursa. rumen right here. And to see the omental bursa, we need to go to the ventral aspect of the rumen. See the omentum right here. And usually you should see a fine line like this here, but not all this. So, um, unfortunately also this animal <laughs> did not survive. Um, but I can tell you, we do save animals, but uh, these are some bad example, good examples for diagnostics, but bad examples for success and treatment. Um, we see here the rumen and then the omental bursitis open it, filled up with apomasal contents. So in that case, the animal had um, omental bursitis caused by a ruptured apomasal ulcer, as we see here, it ruptured into the mental bursa. So there are different ways for ulcers perforating from the apomasum. We do see local peritonitis, which is very similar to the peritonitis caused by foreign bodies. So here we will need to take radiographs to to tell is there a foreign body or not. The best area to, to look for changes caused by this type of apomasal ulcer is the cranial ventral aspect of the abdomen on both sides, but especially on the right side. Then, of course, it can rupture and cause a generalized peritonitis and then we will see findings within the whole ventral abdomen. And then there is that special form of perforating into the omental bursitis. This is what we saw in the last example, causing 
these findings. So in that case, the water was really filled and gas filled, so we could see it on the right side as well. But the typical typical lesion was um, ultrasound lesion was on that side. So to see a ventral bursitis, always look at the also at the ventral aspect of the rumen. These are the typical locations for peritonitis caused by apomasal ulcers that ruptured to different sites, different possible sites. So let's keep talking about the apomasum. We will find the apomasum, of course, on the right side. This is about the image you see on the textbooks on anatomy uh, um, paintings and um, the normal structure of the mucosa. You can see here the uh, mucosal folds of the apomasum. And, um, but the typical location of the pylorus it's not really here, it's right there. So usually we find the pylorus ventrally, not up here, like in the books. It's right here. And um, this is the typical appearance of the pylorus of the apomasum. And you find the pylorus by the end of the subcutaneous abdominal vein. So it's right where it disappears in the abdomen. This is where the um, pylorus can be found. And of course, there's some movements, uh, also motility of the pylorus. So it can look like this, or if it's contracting like this, but there are always these folds. You can see these round structures with folds on the, on the right side. That's the typical findings for the normal appearance of the pylorus. Um, and you can see the motility on this video here. Okay, so a very common disease we, we do see here in, 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 in Switzerland is the left displacement of the apomasum. So it will displace between body wall and rumen, and so we have a gas fluid interface. Um, this is a typical finding in ultrasound. And also we don't see the rumen anymore because the, the rumen is hidden by the apomasum. We might see apomasal folds and we might see the pylorus as well. Um, this is the normal appearance of the rumen, which looks quite boring. There's just the body wall, the rumen wall, and then there are no contents because the rumen wall is very th thick, so we don't get through here, we don't see anything. But the rumen wall should be just adjacent to the body wall. Now this is the typical finding for a left displacement of the apomasum. We're on the left side of the body. Now the Rumen wall is here and the body wall is here. There is something in between. And we have gas. Gas always are these lines, these parallel hyperechoic lines. And this is just ingester of the apomasum. So we do see apomasum here and then the rumen. And this is a very typical finding for left displacement of the apomasum. Um, so this is, again, the normal finding. 
lumen wall, then the ruminal groove, as we saw before, and again, the ventral aspect of the rumen. This is the normal appearance of the rumen. This is a special te um, technique where we can go all the way down and then um, save the whole image. This is usually not a routine image. And now with the displaced apomasum, this is all apomasum now here, as we see here, there's gas, this is fluid and ingester. And again, these parallel hyperechoic lines, typical for um, gas, and then here the ingester. So this is a displaced apomasum to the left side. Of course, we also see displacement of the apomasum to the right side. Here as well, we do see a fluid gas interface. We do see apomasal folds. And important is the liver is not visible anymore. This is an important finding as well. Intestine and omasum are less frequent seen. And um, important is there might be just a displacement to the right, but there might also be a displacement and a volvulus of the apomasum. We're not able to see that on ultrasound. So based on ultrasound, we cannot decide is there a volvulus or not of the apomasum. We just can say it's dilated and displaced to the right side. This is the only thing we can say. And um, so usually we see the liver all the way on the right side behind the ribs and with a displacement of the apomasum to the right side, we again have a gas fluid interface. And also here the same finding gas with these parallel hyperchoic lines and the ingester. This is the typical finding here. When we look for the apomasum on the ventral side, we might see not a displaced, but still a distended apomasum or dilated apomasum, which can be secondary to a obstruction, intestinal, proximal intestinal obstruction. Um, also seen with lymphoma, there's also uh, a severe dilation, but also wall thickening and reflux for whatever reason. So here we see lots of fluid. We see these um, mucosa folds floating in here. So we never should see so much ingester within the apomasum. This is an up, definitely an abnormal finding, but this is a um, um, dilation, which is probably secondary to another problem. Another example, a six-year-old cow, 13 days in milk, um, on rectal examination, the veterinarian was not sure if he could palpate some intestines. On physical examination here, we had a ping on both sides. And on rectal examination, no feces, a dilated cecum, blood work and rumen chloride were normal. On this side, on the right side, we see much ingesta. So there must be a dilated organ, but we can't tell what it is. On the left side, in the area of the reticulum, here's the reticulum again, and there's fluid, which is not normal, some fibrin probably here. And then we went to the caudal aspect of the rumen, and we saw the normal finding, rumen wall, body wall, everything normal. Then we moved the probe a little bit more cranially to this point, and now we see something completely different. Now the rumen wall is here, and we see the cow has a displacement of the apomasum to the left side between body wall and rumen. So ingester and 
gas. This is the ping we are hearing. And a little bit more ventral, we see the pylorus, who should be on the right side, not on the left side. So we have the confirmation that cow has a displacement of the apomasum to the left side. Sometimes because of the dilation, because of the displacement, there is some free fluid in the abdomen. And therefore, if you just look at the reticulum, we see some fluid, we might think there's something wrong with the reticulum, but this is secondary to the displacement of the apomasum. So also here important to, to look at the whole abdomen. Okay, there's also the omasum, which is not very important in terms of ultrasound. We also don't have any really specific clinical findings. There might be secondary uh, problems with peritonitis or apomasal volvulus and so on, but there are no primary diseases we, we see here at least. And um, here again, contents are not visible. Um, sometimes you might see the attachments of the laminae, I will show you. And in healthy cows, there's no motility observed. Maybe with reticulo-omasal stenosis, we might see some motility, um, but probably not very, very specific. Um, omasal impaction is a common problem, probably also secondary, but um, we're not able to diagnose this on ultrasound because we can't look into the omasum. Sometimes you can see ingesta if it's very fluidy, for, for example, reflux, a lot of fluid flowing back into the omasum. Then we might see more structures, but usually the omasum is not seen very well. We see here is the area of the, of the um, omasum between the 10th and the 6th intercostal space on the right side. And here, the right side, this is the liver, the gallbladder. And if you look at the ventral aspect of the liver, we always see omasum as well. So liver, gallbladder, and then part of the omentum. Sometimes you can see a little bit like there are leaves, um, but usually you don't see any more. So omasum is not very exciting in terms of ultrasound. But there are indications to look at the intestine, especially ileus or obstruction or evidence for enteritis. And usually the diam diameter of the small intestine should be something between two to four centimeters. But important is the motility of the intestine. So see, this is the normal motility, very busy here. And every section should open and close. Um, so this is the normal motility of the intestines. This is a normal finding. Now an example for an abnormal finding. This is a um, 6.5 year old brown Swiss cow, this cow here, uh, two month postpartum. She had colic for one day and she was referred. Um, so there was evidence for colic. And also, this is not a cow in the very best shape. <laughs> um, so she didn't eat at all. She was dehydrated. She had a low temperature, no feces, and there was succussion on the right side of the abdomen. And on rectal exam, there was some, some blood, some, some mucus, but not really feces. Look at the blood work. 
um, there's evidence of severe dehydration, some inflammation, some band neutrophils here, um, but more important, we have here evidence for reflux, severe reflux. So this supports our idea of an intestinal obstruction, probably a proximal intestinal obstruction. So we did ultrasound and um, we saw these findings here. So just by looking at it, it looks like distended. We measured and this was 5.4 centimeters. So these are dilated loops. It's not a video, it's just a image, but the motility was reduced. So it was not working well anymore. And there's also fluid in between the intestines. Um, so this is clear evidence of an intestinal obstruction. We kept looking and this is what we found about in this area here. This is the lesion causing the ileus. Um, we have another image of the same. And here we can tell a little bit looks like layers. So that looks like gut in, in gut like an intussusception and if we look at this here we can see the intussusception so um, so there was intestine within intestine causing the obstruction um, so the diagnosis was was intestinal obstruction caused by intussusception within the jejunum this was our finding on surgery, so we see the pre-stenotic and the post-stenotic uh, bowel loops, and then we had to cut this area out, and this is what we got here, is the part of the jejunum disappearing within, within the next loop of the jejunum causing the intersusception. Um, after we cut this out of the cow, we open it up and we see here this part, necrotic. Um, so therefore, an interception always needs to be cut out and uh, anastomosis needs to be built. If you look back at the ultrasound image, um, we can very well see what happened right here. This is the inner part that got into the intestine here. And what happens is that all the blood vessels get uh, kinked and there's no blood supply, so this part will die off. This is what we saw in surgery and this is also what we see here. Usually, so oftentimes you also see some gas in here. And this is when the, uh, the necrotic part is already necrotic for a while. So then there's gas building. You see like gas bubbles in here. This is always bad news. The problem with intestinal obstruction is that the rectal exam is not always reliable um, because the, the fluid in ingesta-filled loops are usually heavy, so they, they will sink in the abdomen to the ventral side, and they're not palpable on rectal exam, um, but they're easily found on ventral ultrasonography. So this is a good extent of the of the physical examination. Um, we have evidence of an intestinal obstruction with dilated loops more than 3.5 centimeter. At the same time, a reduced or absent motility. And oftentimes we do see pre and post obstructive loops. So dilated and empty loops. Um, here are some numbers just should tell the more proxima the lesion, the less dilated loops we see, of course. So if the duodenum is affected, we see maybe one or two, but less than five loops. And if it's jejunum, we see more than five 
uh, dilated loops and ilium even more, also more than five. You see the centimeter, it's a little bit overlapping this information, therefore it's, it's, it's difficult to, uh, um, to, to use, but um, the less dilated loops you see, the more proximal is the problem, which might be important information um, because if you want to um, if you want to cut affected jejunum out, it should be more distally, so you can you can get this out of the cow during surgery. This is an example of an obstruction as well. Here you see movement because the cow is breathing, but you don't see that these intestinal loops are really working, like closing, opening, closing. Um, um, they're dilated and they're not actively moving. And here another example, dilated, 5.5 centimeter, so this is dilated intestine. This is an example with dilated loops and at the same time empty loops, you have pre and post stenotic loops. So for diagnosing intestinal obstruction, ultrasound is really helpful. Sometimes we are lucky we even can see the lesion, but not always. Now the next important organ is the liver. Everybody could recover from the first part. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, next topic is the liver. And um, there are some important indications to um, look at the, at the whole liver. Um, for example, abscesses, liver abscesses. Uh, and we know there are different reasons to form abscesses within the liver. can be um, spread by blood or traumatic by a foreign body. Evidence for cholestasis or bile duct proliferation. We do, in Switzerland, we have a problem with liver flukes causing calcification of the bile ducts, which we can see well on ultrasound. Also fatty liver. And one very important um, finding is the thrombosis of the caudal vena cava, which can also cause respiratory problems once uh, thromboembolic pneumonia develops. And of course, neoplasia in some cases, um, but the most often findings are these above. Um, so for orientation, the liver on the right side. So this is the last rib. And we can see the liver between the 13th and the 5th rib. This is the vena cava. I'm just showing because in this area we can see the vena cava caudalis passing the liver. And this is an important point you need to look at on ultrasound. So, um, now, another view for orientation. We start, uh, sorry, let me go one slide back. We start in the last intercostal space and then we scan all the way through every intercostal space, the whole rib. So starting in the 12th and 11th intercostal space, we see the liver and then the vena cava passing the liver at this area. And due to the shape, the vena cava appears to be a triangle. Uh, and this is what we want to see. This is the normal appearance of the venal, of the vena cava caudalis. 
And this is what we all, always want to look for if this is normal in a triangle shape. This is also a blood vessel within the liver, the right hepatic vein, but more important is this vena cover. So now a little bit more cranially, a little bit more down here is the portal vein. We also see within the um, liver tissue and it has always a little bit, depending on how you move, the probe has a different shape, but always like, like uh, blood vessels going out of that area. So this is the shape of the portal vein, which changes all the time one, uh, as you move uh, the probe. And then a little bit more down ventrally, um, this is what we saw before when we talked about the omasum. Now you can see the gallbladder here, the ventral aspect of the liver. Normal liver tissue, and this is the gallbladder. And this is normal that this looks more hyperechoic. This is just because here is anechoic. So everything is going through here. And then this side always appears to be more um, hyperechoic. This is due to the technique, not due to the anatomy. So one important finding is uh, liver abscess. These are circumscribed structures. Um, and changes within the parenchyma. Um, the content can be anechoic or hyperechoic. In early stages, there no cap there's no capsule. It's just a change in the parenchyma and maybe smaller size at this point. At a later stage, there's a capsule, as we see here, the hyperechoic capsule of this abscess you see even some shadowing here. This is because of the density of the capsule. And um, you can see just one single abscess or multiple abscesses. Usually with hematogenous spreading, the, the cow has more than one abscess, little or bigger abscesses. Importance in the location. And um, if you want to treat those, it's important. They should be less than three centimeters, then you have a good chance that they um, will heal. If they are bigger, it's probably not possible that they will heal. There might be a possibility to lance these abscesses if they are if they're adhered to the body wall, otherwise it's not possible. So you see different shapes. On the left side, this abscess right here. So there's no capsule, but this is this round hypo, a little bit more hypoechoic structure is very suspicious for an abscess. Um, when you use the probe, always keep moving so you can see if it's a tubular or a round structure. If it's a round structure, it's very uh, likely to be an abscess. Um, and on the right side, the example I showed before, this is an older abscess with a capsule within the liver parenchyma. So these are two different appearances of an abscess in the liver. Now, Back to the example we had before with the abscess caused by a foreign body. Um, they're expected to be more in this area because the reticulum is right here. So there's, they get very close together. And this is the area where an, uh, a foreign body can stick into the liver, causing an abscess. Um, now, difficult for ultrasound is that there are also ribs and um, this area is 
difficult to see on ultrasound, but again, it's important. Um, see, this is the normal appearance. The, the, lots of lots of views are lost because of the ribs, but it's still important to look very close here and to follow the liver all the way down here. This is a, the example I showed before with that abscess. And um, this is, we got this liver frozen and then cut into a half. And here you can see um, normal liver tissue. And this is a huge abscess with a capsule here, um, as we saw in the ultrasound image. <clears throat> okay. So here's another case, another example. It's a four-year-old Red Holstein cow, not pregnant. Already one week of depression, she got antibiotics, which was not successful. On physical examination, depression, fever. The withers pinch test was positive, so we could we could, when we grabbed her with us, we could cause some grunting, some pain reaction, and which might be um, uh, suspicious for a foreign body, for example. On blood work, there was also evidence for inflammation, but very unspecific because of the fever, because of the inflammation. He knew there must be somewhere inflammation. There must be somewhere uh, an area with the problem, and while we did the ultrasound exam, we're on this side here, looking at the liver, and here we got an abscess. And this is a little bit more ventral because here is already a the little little tip of the of the gallbladder. This is the omasum body wall liver, um, blood vessels. You might also see some, some bile ducts. Usually, uh, sometimes it's difficult to tell if it's a bile duct or a blood vessel. You can, uh, when you use the um, Doppler sonogram, then you can tell if there's, uh, if it's f uh, flowing or not. Um, but usually that size, these are usually blood vessels. But this is definitely a suspicious area here, and this is typical for an abscess. Now, it's important to see, are there more abscess than just one? Usually, if you see one of those, there are probably more. Um, so we went up a little bit, this area here, and there's another one showing up. And um, so this cow, the reason for the fever, and the reason for the inflammation was the cow had liver abscesses, um, the size was not very large, so here we could try um, to treat the cow, and we also um, successfully treated the cow. But a good example, not only for a finding in the liver, also these cows that are chronically ill, that have fever, inter-recurrent fever, it's always important to find the lesion, and, and the ultrasound is really the best to, to find because uh, even the findings on the physical exam are, are quite unspecific in these cases. So um, this is a good indication for ultrasound. Now, another finding on, uh, on the liver is uh, cholestasis. So we have an obstructed bile duct somewhere. Uh, and if it's a proximal, obstruction within the hepatic hilus, this area, we have dilated intrahepatic bile ducts. And if it's a distal obstruction, the, in the area of the uh, duodenal papilla, usually the common bile duct is very enlarged, and also the gallbladder will be dilated, severely dilated, so everything is flowing back into the gallbladder. So these are the two forms of cholestasis. 
Of course, we have some very specific clinical signs for that, um, but still it's important to find out with the ultrasound where the lesion is. And um, this is an example for a post-hepatic ulystasis. We have normal liver tissue right here, and then the common bile duct is obstructed here, causing the geolistasis is the aspect of the gallbladder. So this is a finding in post-hepatic geolistasis. We also have a, the, the uh, gallbladder is not quite distended here, but what we see is the sediment here. Typically in cows with um, um, inflammation of the bile ducts with a liver flukes, for example. So this is the sludge in here, the typical uh, um, sediment. Now, intrahepatic geolistasis, then we have these intrahepatic bile ducts. We usually don't see they're quite dilated and um, so the obstruction is higher in the hilus area of the liver. There's one differential diagnosis. This might look like a heolistasis, but in this case, these are not bile ducts. These are blood vessels. It's very rare, but we had a case like this with a hamartoma, so with a tumor or with a yeah, like tumor-like lesion. Um, and this is just a, as a differential to the intrahepatic heolistasis. Now, Let's look back at the vena cava caudalis. This, again, is an important structure. The normal diameter, somehow 1.8 to 5 centimeter, um, triangle sh shape, and if it's dilated, it's, uh, the diameter is increased, of course, but there's also a round shape. And there are three possible differentials for that. Can be due to congestive heart failure, thrombosis of the vena, or compression of the vena. And um, here is the abnormal finding. This is the vena cover that should be in triangle shape, but here it's dilated. And um, so this is a um, pathologic finding. I usually repeat the ultrasound a day later to make sure it's still there. Maybe there's, there's one reason um, it is dilated or there's an, there's an unknown reason it's dilated. Maybe it's not dilated anymore next day. Uh, I feel more comfortable to recheck a day later just to make sure because the decisions that have to be made are, are uh, um, important for the cow, so for the survival of the cow. So I like to recheck here to make sure. Um, and this is a also a very old image, but a rare image, because here we see the vena cava. It's not quite rounded, but we see something inside. So in that case, we even see a thrombus Usually we don't see it, the thrombus, but if we just are lucky to hit exactly that spot, we do see the thrombus and uh, that cow. And this is the thrombus within the vena. It's attached to the wall. So somehow it came from the liver building up in the blood vessel with thrombus forming. And so this is a typical septic thrombus and um, causing the typical signs. Now, um, here's another one with the thrombus in there, round-shaped, round-shaped uh, vena cava, and also an ascites because the blood vessel is obstructed, but usually we don't see a situs with thrombosis of the vena cava caudalis because there are some bypasses like the 
vena subclavia, the subcutaneous abdominal vein. So there are some bypasses. So usually if the vena cava is obstructed, there is not necessarily uh, ascites. This is important because there are some differentials. This is a dilated vena cava caused by congestive heart failure in that case. Of course, we do see typical clinical signs like a dilated jugular vein, and this, so this is not only here, but we also see it here. And, and with the congestive heart, oops, sorry, with the congested heart failure, we also see ascites, free abdominal fluid. This is the liver, and this is free fluid. But it doesn't look like peritonitis. It's anechoic. There's no fibrin. There's no ingesta, whatever. This is just fluid. So if we see a dilated vena cava, we mainly have three differentials. One is the thrombosis, but also the compression like a, a space occupying lesion, like a tumor, like um, an abscess compressing the vena cava. So then the vena cava also looks distended. And the third differential is the congestive heart failure, but then we also see distended jugular veins. So these are the three important differentials for a distended vena cava caudalis. Now, also belonging to the systematic examination of the abdomen is the urinary tract. Most important lesions, pyelonephritis, urethiasis, and hydronephrosis. And if renal disease, if there's renal disease, uh, one possibility would be a nephrectomy. So we just cut one kidney out. But before we do that, we need to know is only one kidney affected or both. So here it's very important to look at the whole urinary tract to make a decent decision. So unfortunately, this is quite limited. Um, the right kidney we can see from transabdominal ultrasound within the right dorsal Flank. And on rectal ultrasound, we can see the parts of the left kidney, the ureter, and the urinary bladder. Now, this is the right kidney from the right side. And every just what is black appears to be black is what we can see on ultrasound. So we can't see the entire kidney, unfortunately. Here is the ureter. If it's really distended, we can even see it from here. But usually we can't see the left kidney on transabdominal ultrasound. Sometimes we do, sometimes we do, but not always. So then we need to do a rectal ultrasound, and then we just can see the tip of the, of the kidney. Unfortunately, we can't see the whole kidney. Uh, so our possibilities are quite limited. But we also can see the bladder and the urethra from, from both sides. Usually we don't see them and we don't feel them on palpation, but if they are distended or if there are even stones inside, we can palpate and we can see it on ultrasound. Um, the normal structure of 
the bovine kidney. We can see here on ultrasound, this is the normal finding of the kidney. And for orientation from the right side, between the last rib and the third lumbar vertebrae, this is the area where we find the right kidney. Sometimes we can go from here, depending on how fat the cow is. And a little bit of the cranial aspect of the kidney is covered by the liver. And so this is the image you sometimes get. It's like there's something in the liver, something there's liver parenchyma and something is in the liver, but this is a kidney just overlapping with the liver. <clears throat> so I would like to bring another example. We have a three-year-old brown Swiss cow with acute colic, no feces, reduced appetite, and on physical examination, the general condition was reduced, temperature was quite low, heart rate as well. Looking at the blood work, we see mainly severe acetemia. So we have micromole per liter. Normal should be up to 103. This is 833. So really severe acetemia, um, which is in combination with colic, which is suspicious for uh, urinary obstruction. And also the very high potassium, usually in sick cows, in anorectic cows, we have more likely hypokalemia, low potassium. So um, the high potassium and this acetemia is suspicious for post-renal obstruction. Um, Phosphate is really, really low in this case. So we have an indication to look very close at the, at the urinary tract. Of course, colic, we would start looking at intestines, evidence for intestinal obstruction, at least proximal obstruction is not typical in this blood work here. We don't see any evidence of reflux, um, but it's also very acute. So maybe there's still some reflux uh, coming, but um, another reason for colic would be cholestasis. So we look at the liver, the gallbladder as well, which was all normal. There was no evidence of, uh, of intestinal obstruction. There was no evidence of um, cholestasis. So we had to look at the urinary tract. And now we are on the right side, transabdominal. So looking at the right kidney. And Here's the kidney, and this is suspicious already, this hyperechoic um, rim line here, also the shadowing. So behind that hyperechoic structure, it's, it's just anechoic, nothing gets through there. So this is maybe evidence for calcification or for um, like little concrements in the urine that are sedimented in this part of the kidney. Now we went a little bit more caudally, and this is this is transabdominal. 
and this is see we are right here so we, we, we almost get there and this is the dilated ureter which we usually don't see so we never find a healthy ureter but this is dilated definitely dilated hypoechoic fluid in there so urine and um, so this is a very severe finding so we have already evidence for a urinary obstruction now we looked at the left kidney so we had to move to rectal ultrasound and now we get quite close to the kidney so we have another appearance of the kidney this is a nice normal structure but this is dilated a dilated part here with uh, probably a urolith a stone in there uh, so this is probably the reason for the obstruction now we do see suspicious findings on the left and on the right kidneys so now it's hard to decide can we should we should we euthanize the cow or should we go to surgery take one kidney out but then is the question which kidney should we take out the cow has severe colic so we need to do something we need to decide something and um, what i like to add in these cases is um, cystoscopy so we look into the bladder and we look at both sides where the ureter comes in and where the urine comes in. So I would like to see is the urine coming from both sides or only from one side, and then we can decide if it makes sense to take a kidney out or not, and of course, which kidney. So something, we don't see it here. Uh, I, I know it because I know the case, but I wouldn't be able to see it here if I wouldn't know the image, but there's a little stone in there. So there was no urine coming out. And at the end, this is what came out. And um, this is what we found in the kidney. Unfortunately, on both sides, obstructing stones. The reason for that can be uh, pyelonephritis, um, inflammation, and then concrements forming, stones forming. And, and unfortunately, if it's both sides, it doesn't make sense to get a kidney out. This is These are other examples here. This is a more... Um, yeah, you can see it better here in this um, case. We see normal tissue here, but this is all hyperechoic structures here. Um, so these are little stones in the in the within the kidney, causing the shadowing as a specific finding for urethritis in a cow, and. Um, this is the same kidney here, and we see how this is filled up here in every lobe of that kidney. And what we also can see on rectal ultrasound is the urethra. And here it's severely dilated, so there must be an obstruction causing this finding. And this image, it's the same case. We see the um, urethra dilated fluid, but also here the material, hyperechoic material in here. And um, you see on the next image, see this is what we found in the urethra. This is the opened urethra, shouldn't be that big and dilated, but then these are those concrements causing the problem. Another example, again, kidney. 
with hyperechoic material within the pyramide, and this is the the kidney we see there. This is the space with the fluid, the parenchyma, dilated pyramid, and the echoic material in here. And um, again, an example for the dilated urethra with the echoic material inside there. So the rectal ultrasound is a good extension of the whole examination. When we suspect, usually we don't do it in every animal, but when we suspect an obstruction or a disease of the urinary tract, then we need to do rectal ultrasound of the bladder, of the uh, ureters, and the as much as we can get of the left kidney. Uh, just back to the cystoscopy. Sometimes you can see the stones already within the urinary bladder. Then we just need to find out which side is affected. And um, this is a video where we can see the urine flowing from one side. So we know this side is still patent and not the affected side. other um, diagnostic tools since ultrasound is not uh, giving us all ans answers especially with the um, urinary tract it's important to find other tools to get to a decision and, and, and the endoscopy of the bladder is a very good um, supplementation to our ultrasound Sometimes we can see hydronephrosis, like these dilated parts of the kidney, um, can be congenital, of course, but also acquired due to obstruction. So every urinary obstruction by time will cause um, a hydronephrosis. And these findings here, this will be how these kidneys look on on, on the cut surface. <clears throat> and this is just a uh, very rare example of severe hydronephrosis, so there's no parenchyma anymore. This is also cut and frozen, and uh, you see this is what is was supposed to be the kidney. Um, of course, a rare finding as well. So with that, I hope I could give you a good it overview on all the possibilities and the indications for abdominal ultrasound. Um, in our clinic, we like to do a lot of ultrasound, of course, but we also see a lot of indications. So every cow with a unclear diagnosis based on physical examination. So therefore it's an extension of the physical examination. Um, it confirms clinical diagnosis and we can more specify problems and it's a good tool to decide um, how to treat the cow. So especially colic workup we need to know, can we, how can we help the cow? Is it just medical treatment? Do we need to go to surgery or do we have to stop because the animal is suffering too much and the prognosis is poor? Um, ultrasound helps us every day and, and um, it's quite exciting. Every, every new case is exciting to look at. And um, yeah, I hope I could, I could share a little bit with you and um, you could benefit from, from that. Again, thank you very much, everybody involved, for inviting me, for giving me the chance to present. And um, 
I felt very well. Everything was really well organized and um, it was a perfect organization. I hope my, my presentation helped um, as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank Professor, you Professor Singh. Is back. Is back. Your, lecture, Your lecture, we are, we are very much fascinated, fascinated motivated, motivated, impressed by the way in which the lecture was presented. presented. Sir, can you, Sir, mute, can you your mute your mic? mic? Sir, can you put your mic on mute? Yeah. So we are very much impressed by the way in which the, each case is discussed with a lot of case studies, wonderful illustrations, excellent images coming on to the diagnosis, explaining with ultrasound. So we are very much impressed and we have got a lot of points for our day-to-day -day clinical diagnosis. This lecture in fact, improved our skill in ultrasonography. May I request our respected and beloved director of clinics, Dr. S. Balasubranim, for the concluding remarks. Thank you, Dr. Christian Giesbeck. It was indeed uh, an excellent uh, lecture. I don't need to say that, but still, uh, I cannot resist from telling that. So it was very impressive. And uh, I think uh, there was less uh, text material because normally people, uh, uh, they, they are a little reluctant when they, they see a lot of text. But uh, it was really, as he said, it was really fantastic, like uh, just case studies to the point and uh, certain points like when you, when you told that the pylorus, even in textbook, they show it is ventral. But uh, 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 the way you told, I think uh, many have to learn. Uh, that shows your experience and uh, your long uh, uh, association or uh, long experience in the ultrasonography. So I, I think uh, definitely the students as well as faculty, because we ourselves uh, having put in so many years of service. So we were so impressed about the, after a very long time, after a very, very long time, we, have, we are listening to such type of a lecture. And uh, we are fortunate and we made a right decision to invite uh, Dr. Christian for this webinar. So I thank you very much uh, from the bottom of my heart that uh, it was really a wonderful uh, lecture. And uh, uh, thank you for uh, accepting. Uh, and we, we, we hope that maybe after this pandemic situation, uh, we would like to invite you to our institute so that uh, we'll have a, a direct uh, uh, hands-on training. So thank you very much once again. Thank you too. Thank you much. Uh, thank you, sir, for the nice concluding remarks. May I request uh, Dr. Chari Gupta for the vote of thanks. Dr. Chari Gupta. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Good evening, one and all. I, Dr. Chari Gupta, Assistant Professor, Veterinary Clinical Complex, Veterinary College and Research Institute, Tirnavedi, being with a great honor and privilege to propose vote of thanks and acknowledge the contribution of each and everyone for the successful conduct of Global Biotech Medicine Webinar Series 2020, organized by Veterinary Clinical Complex, Directorate of Clinics, VCRA, Tenerveli, Tanwar. First and foremost, on the behalf of organizing committee, I express my profound gratitude to our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Sir, Dr. C. Balachandran Sir, who despite his busy schedule has found time to grace this occasion and presenting introduction of the webinar. Thank you, Sir, for your inspiring and motivating words. Now, wholeheartedly, I am expressing my sincere thanks to our beloved Director of Clinics, Dr. S. Balasubramanian Sir, for constantly encouraging us with his holistic ideologies and 
his presidential address. Thank you, sir. I am glad to express my heartfelt gratitude to Dr. Christian Graspak, Director of Clinics for Luminance, head and Head of Internal Medicine Department, University of Zurich, Switzerland, for enlightening us on abdominal ultrasonography in cattle. Thank you, sir. Your presentation was beautiful and photographs were clear, and these case studies will always help us. I extend my respectful thanks to all the university officers, deans, and directors of Canvas for their hard work and virtual support behind the success of every webinar of this series. Thank you, sir. I extend my heartfelt thanks to Dean MDC for providing the conference hall for the successful content of this webinar. I also express my gratitude to Dean Basic Science for deputing faculties and staff to conduct the webinar smoothly. Thanks, sir, for your technical support. I would like to extend my sincere thanks to our organizing secretary, Dr. R. Ram Prabhu, sir, Professor and Head, Veterinary Clinical Complex, BCRA, Terminal Delhi, and co-organizing secretary, Dr. G. Vijay Kumar, sir, Professor and Head, Veterinary University, Peripheral Hospital, Chennai, for their meticulous planning on this webinar and came out with great success. Thank you, sir. I am also expressing my sincere thanks to Mr. Karnanidhi, Vice President, LME Pharma and Dr. Santosh Shinde, LME Pharma, our information technology partners for their immense support by providing the digital platform Microsoft Team so we could conduct the webinar in an uninterrupted manner. Thank you, sir. I like to extend my thanks to Depa HOD Department of Animal Husbandry and Extension Madras Veterinary College for providing audio-visual aid for this webinar. Thank you, sir. A team event always proved to be a great successful event. In the same way, the sincere efforts of all committee members, moderators, and technical staff who led this webinar in a great success. Thanks to all. Last but not the least, I like to thank all the participants all around the globe, bovine practitioners, bovine faculty members of Tanwas and other colleges, and our dear students for seeking their keen interest in this event, which grace this webinar a great success. Finally, I thank everyone for their kind cooperation and making this webinar a resounding success. Thank you, sir. Have a nice day.